couple of housekeeping things before we worship together. In the pews, you find these blue sheets, and we um, remind you, for those who are regulars, and uh, inform you, for those who are not, if you'd like us to be in prayer for something or someone, please jot it down on this sheet of paper. And as we sing, you can put it in the basket here. Um, come forward and bring it there. And if you would like us to send a prayer letter, just indicate that there. You'll see a place on the sheet where it, uh, you can check the box that says, please send a prayer letter. And we will do that. If we don't know the address of the person, you have to give us the address, okay? Um, also, along the center aisle are those red books. We invite you to let us know you're here. And there is one prayer concern that we're going to share at the top of the service at the beginning. Prayers for our friends and our neighbors, um, our Muslim neighbors, close to home and around the world in the wake of the violence several days ago in New Zealand. There's going to be a prayer letter in the back of the church, and we really want to encourage you to sign it. I also <clears throat> want to encourage you as individuals, I think it's I think it's wonderful for us as a church to do something, but I would encourage you as an individual to go to the Islamic Center's um, site, and you you can um, be in touch with them on a more personal level there, uh, letting them know of your thoughts and prayers to be with them. But there will also be a prayer letter in the back of the church. Okay. Okay. Today we continue. This is um, this is week is this week two. Yeah, week two of uh, our Lenten series on spiritual autobiographies as we consider folks who are um, called saints of the church and what their life work was and how it can inspire our own relationship with God today. And so uh, Rachel will be touching base with Teresa of Avila, St. Teresa today. As we begin to worship, let's turn um, in the faith we sing, which is a small black Hymnals or the words will be on the screen, The Lone Wild Bird. It's number 2052, 2052 in the small black hymnal. Let's pray and then we'll sing together. <laughs> Holy Spirit, come and dwell within us and among us. Open our hearts and our eyes and our minds um, to the truth of God's love, to the power of God's presence to the hope of God's healing, to our need for forgiveness from God and from each other. Bless our time of worship. Let it draw us closer to you and to one another. In the name of Jesus we pray.
27th Psalm. It's on page 758 and 759 in your red hymn books, and it will also appear on the screen. Please read the bold printed portion of the psalm. The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is strong in my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes shall stumble and fall. Though a host encamps against me, and my heart shall not fear. Though a war rises against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in the Lord's temple. The Lord will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble, will conceal me under the cover of his tent and will set me high upon a rock. Now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies around me, and I will offer sacrifice in the Lord's tent with the shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody for the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart, say, seek the Lord's face. Your face, O Lord, I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, for you have been my help. Cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother should forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your ways, O Lord, and lead me on one level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the world of adversaries. A false witness has risen against me, and they breathe out lies. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. O Lord, be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. I'd like to invite any of the little ones to come up for our children's message. Any little ones want to come up today? There we go. Come on down, guys. Got, a, got some questions to ask you. Hello, good morning. Good morning. So, I have a question for you. When you get ready for bed at night, or maybe even maybe when you were littler, maybe not anymore if you're, if you're older, but you know, when you get ready for bed at night, does anybody ever give you any cuddles to go to sleep? Or did you when you were younger? Did, does anybody get cuddle around bedtime? <laughs> yeah, you might? Okay. <laughs> the boys are up here looking at I'll, I'll admit it if you admit it. <laughs> Do you, do you like to get hugs from somebody in your family? Yeah? Maybe a mom or a dad or a grandparent, aunts and uncles, right? I love to cuddle my little girls. Now, my little girls, you know them, are not very little anymore. But they'll always be my little girls. So even though they're about my size now, they're still, they're still little to me, and I still cuddle them, right? As parents, we love, love to cuddle our kiddos, right? You know, bring them in and, and give, give some good cuddles. And you feel loved. Do you feel loved when you get cuddled? When you get a hug from somebody who loves you? Yeah? Yeah, it feels, it feels loving, right? Well, have you heard that Jesus taught us to think about God as Papa? Father, loving Papa? he did. He said, when you pray to God, pray to God as if he is your father. So when we say um, our, the Lord's Prayer, it starts with our father, right? Well, one of the reasons he did that is because where do we first learn how to love? 
Where did we first experience love? What do you think? What do you think? When do you think was the first time you felt loved? Any idea? Do you think, do you think this little one experiences love when her mama holds her? Do you experience love when your mama holds you? I bet you do. I can see it all over your face. I bet when you were really, really small and your parents held you, that was one of the first times you experienced love before you even knew what that meant. Well, God teaches us, Jesus teaches us, that God loves us just like that. Like a parent who wants to give their child a big hug and hold them close, especially when they're sad. When you're sad, do you go to somebody to, to get some hugs? Does somebody hug you when you're sad? Sometimes, yeah. Do you feel comforted by them? I guess so. Do you feel loved in those moments? The boys are still looking at each other. Oh. But we do, right? We, we, feel, we feel some love and, and some comfort. Well, God says, you can come to me just like that. As we get older, other people love us. So, for instance, I mentioned my daughters. Not only do I give them love when I cuddle them, but they also give me love. And so I learn a little bit about God's love from my children, too. And we might learn a little bit about God's love from our friends. Have you ever given a friend a hug and been happy that you'd got a, gotten a hug from a friend? Those are other ways we feel love, right? And so God starts to teach us about love when we're held by people who love us. Thank you, you made a perfect pop. <laughs> because, because as little ones get love, so God sees us as God's little ones to love us so very, very much. And so when you pray, Think about God loving you as you pray, just the way you feel when you're held by somebody who loves you. It's interesting, isn't it? Let's say a prayer together, shall we? Oh, beloved God, Mama God, Papa God, however we meet you, thank you for loving us, and thank you for teaching us the way of your love through one another and through those who love us. May we always feel your love in our lives, especially in times that our lives are hard. In your name we pray, amen. All right, you guys can go to Sunday school. Thank you, sweetie. <laughs> So glad to be here today, and God blessed me to be here today so I could witness to you about the goodness of the Lord. The last couple of weeks I had some, some emotional, personal things going on with, with family back at home in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and it was affecting me emotionally here. Um, so I didn't really feel like coming out and sharing my distress with everybody. You know, sometimes we get like that. It's like, no, this is mine. I need to do some soul searching and I need to do some praying. And one night about 3.30 in the morning after I had cried myself to sleep, I woke up and I remembered God's already got the answer. Just wait. And I knew I was okay then. When I felt that in my heart, I got up out of my bed and I walked around the room because I was praising God. 
thank you for lifting this burden off of me. It's not mine. I can't carry it. I need some help sometime. And I am not ashamed to cry in public. I've gotten over myself. <laughs> Sometimes I just have to let it go. Still, and I can still be a tough guy with a soft, with the soft inner. <laughs> anyway, my thoughts were uh, this morning is to just express that, and I'm dealing with my uh, visual imperity, so don't mind if I miss some of the words. <laughs> I'm gonna sing. Oh, how I love Jesus. It is in, on uh, page 170 in this hymnal. And uh, sing along, please. There is a name I love to hear. I love to speak its word. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me a loving heart can fill my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me once again. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. If I sang it 10 more times, my voice would be back in normal. <laughs> Amen. Praise be to God. Today's scripture lesson is Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of the God, Command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him an in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will be all yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on a pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. 
and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. The word of the Lord for the people of the God, Lord. Please join me in prayer first. Oh, loving God, you love us as a mother, father, friend, one who holds us so close and guides us forth. This day I pray that you would guide these words of mine and make them into a word of yours, where they are merely mine and no harm would be done. In your name we pray. Amen. The season of Lent is one of introspection, reflection on spiritual disciplines and a denial of unhealthy ego. We take time to consider the deeper meanings of life and the reality of death. We acknowledge the wilderness that we so often find ourselves in, and we take a long look at the temptations that surround us every day. This is a season of preparation. Throughout the season of Lent, Mark and I are doing a preaching series on the lives of some of the saints, both canonized or not, who have gone before us and have taught us much about the kingdom of God. Today's scripture reading, as we just heard, it's the quintessential Lenten passage. Our observation of Lent mimics Jesus' 40-day experience of self-denial and temptation in the wilderness. The first temptation is so basic that it, it speaks to all of us with ease. Are you hungry? Turn these stones into bread. What are you willing to exchange to feed the desires of your life from your belly when you're hungry, craving for entertainment? anything in between. The second is the temptation of power, influence, and control. It may seem beyond our personal experience, but who of us has not wished for more money at some point? Or taken a shortcut to gain access to a better position in life? Or even just lost our temper in a fit of rage when things are beyond our control and don't go our way. This is the temptation, the second one. The third temptation is more in the spiritual realm. What are we tempted to believe about God? I've heard people say that God won't ever give someone more than they can handle. But that is a misrepresentation of the words of St. Paul. When we hear the line from St. Paul, he's talking about temptation, not tragedy. Tragedies happen. The Holocaust was too much for anyone to handle. The shooting this week, too much for anyone to handle. God isn't pulling the strings of reality and making things happen for us or against us. People die every day. Tragedies happen all the time. Every single one of us will die. No one gets out alive. God neither makes it happen nor prevents it from happening. But God is there with us through it all. The temptation can be resisted. That will never be more than we can handle. If we are tempted to cause harm to others, that we can resist. The third temptation is about believing something completely inaccurate about God. And if your faith is based on the assumption 
that God will prevent bad things from happening in your life, your faith is going to fail you. Bad things happen. Do not put your Lord God to the test. We encourage each other to think about mortality during Lent in order to prepare ourselves. God is with us through it all. These are the good words, the good news. Today we look at the life of Teresa of Avila, sometimes known as Saint Teresa of Jesus. Teresa seemed to live her life through the prism of this gospel passage we just read. She was, from a very young age, wandering in a wilderness of her own emotional state and felt tempted at every moment. She found rest and comfort in God. And her prayer life is one that has inspired countless Christians ever since. Teresa grew up in a Catholic home, a devout Catholic home in the 1500s. It's around the time of the Reformation, and she's part of the Counter-Reformation. Teresa's mother died when she was only 11 years old, and it devastated her. It left her feeling empty and alone. This moment truly sparked the beginning of her endless wilderness wandering. At first, she turned to the Holy Virgin Mary for support and maternal comfort, an image in the Catholic Church that allows for this maternal presence of the divine. As a teen, she turned away from her faith. Being very charismatic, she made a lot of different friends, and some of these friends her family disapproved of. So her father, a strict man, sent her to a convent when she was 16, in order to both further her education and to bring her out of harm's way, help her refocus her life. Teresa returned to her faith, and after much wrestling, she even became a nun, which was not her father's intention. In fact, I think his trying to keep her safe went overboard for him. He wanted her safe, not that safe. That was more safe than he wanted. Faith, truly, right, is not that safe. However, in the convent, she became frustrated by the hypocrisy there that she found, where wealth was more impressive than faith, and the daughters of the rich were given favoritism. Soon after taking religious orders, she became ill. We think it was malaria, and she nearly died. Through the pain of this illness, which lasted years, she began to have spiritual experiences that would become more and more vivid over the course of her lifetime. She claimed that during her illness, she rose from the lowest stage, recollection, to the devotions of silence or even to the devotions of ecstasy, which was one of perfect union with God. And during this final stage, she frequently experienced a rich blessing of tears. When I was in high school, I took an art history class. There are a few pieces of art that I found compelling at the time, but only one that I can visualize consistently 25 years later. It is this image of Teresa called The Ecstasy of St. Teresa by Bernini, which was created around 1650, shortly after Teresa was canonized in the Roman Catholic Church. I want us to hear a little bit from some art historians about this piece. So we're going to hear a, a short clip here. Beside me, on the left, appeared an angel in bodily form. He was not tall, but short, and very beautiful. And his face was so aflame that he appeared to be one of the highest ranks of angels who seemed to be all on fire. In his hands I saw a great golden spear, and at the iron tip there appeared to be a point of fire. This he plunged into my heart several times so that it penetrated to my entrails. When he pulled it out, I felt that he took them with it and left me utterly consumed by the great love of God. The pain was so severe that it made me utter several moans. 
The sweetness caused me by this intense pain is so extreme that one cannot possibly wish it to cease, nor is one's soul content with anything but God. This is not a physical, but a spiritual pain, though the body has some share in it, even a considerable share. These are actually Teresa's words that the artist took and created into this piece that's installed in a fairly sizable cathedral in Spain. This particular expression of prayer, this experience, was one of many for Teresa. It is by far the most evocative and erotic expressions of prayer that I have ever heard. And she had many of them over the course of her lifetime. Experiences so transforming, she at times felt the illumining grace of God would wash away her soul. It is said she was so filled with divine contemplation that at times her body would spontaneously levitate. Interesting image. Unfortunately, this was also the time of the Spanish Inquisition. And she was scrutinized. This type of vision, this type of prayer, this type of expression of faith was checked, was held suspect. She became afraid, and for many years, she even set aside her prayer life, her entire prayer life. She stopped praying in order to remain within the Catholic faith. Then in her early 40s, she returned to her prayer, her prayer life after some encouragement from a priest who had come to visit her. Soon after, she felt compelled to start a new branch of the religious community, convents and monasteries. These would be about recommitting to the values of poverty and simplicity. She proved to be an influential leader and founder. She guided the nuns not just through strict discipline, but also through the power of love and common sense. Her way was not the way of rigid asceticism and self-denial, although she underwent many tribulations herself. To others, she stressed the importance of experiencing God's love. She continued to get critique, and the Pope at the time said, described her as thus, a restless, disobedient gadabout who has gone about teaching as though she were a professor. Haughty words. Get about. <laughs> Teresa established many new monastic communities through her lifetime, and she taught prayer, truly powerful and transformative prayer, as the center of faithful living. This prayer would transform souls and inspire loving goodness toward the world. These are the basic steps of her prayer. She says, begin with vocal prayer. Utilize a previously written prayer, like the Lord's Prayer, or in the case of Roman Catholics, the Rosary, or maybe some other scripted prayer to just help begin to find our focus in our prayer experience. The next step was uh, discursive meditation, where you would read a scripture passage or maybe from some devotional, um, not with the intention of finding an argument with it, which some of us are wont to do. We start reading a section of the Bible and we want to analyze it and maybe argue with it. No. You read it simply to find out what God might be saying through it to you at that moment. And start to listen. And then the next step is effective prayer. And for this, she recommends choose an image of Christ. It doesn't have to be something you're actually looking at. It can be just something you're visualizing. She would often use the image of Christ kneeling in the garden. Gethsemane. There are many other images, maybe Christ holding a lamb or with the little children. There are so many different images that, that might uh, evoke our love and wonder. And then she said to take that image and use it as a meditative focus. I don't know if you've ever practiced meditation before, but often you'll try to find something to focus on. Well, this image is what she would recommend and then take time to simply allow yourself to feel the love for God well up inside of you. 
like I was saying with the children, this is those moments when you're simply being held by God. You imagine God holding you as perhaps you remember a parent holding you or a grandparent. Or maybe you remember holding your own child that way, imagining God holding you in that moment. And just sit with the love. Each time our minds wander, bring it back to this image. Then the last stage of prayer that we can reach, as she would put it, without special divine intervention, is called acquired recollection. Here we begin to gaze at Jesus with love, saying a few words now and then, but mostly simply soaking in his presence. It's a continuation of the previous one. And we might go back to remind ourselves of that image, but just to be in those moments in love with God. Beyond this, Teresa tells us, we must rely on God. The next three steps, as she would teach, are infused recollection, which is when we hear or feel God's words to us and God's love for us returning through the act of prayer. Recollection alternates between something our soul produces through grace and the pure act of God. The next step is the prayer of quiet. Then God begins to take over our prayer more and more. He begins, he brings us to the prayer of quiet. Here the will becomes God's captive. But she said, the mind sometimes races around wildly, not knowing what to do with itself. I love that image. Our will has been held captive by God, but our mind still races. And then the last step. If we continue on the path of prayer and virtue, she would teach, and one cannot grow uh, without both of those, then we will eventually be brought to the prayer of union. Here, God suspends the operations of both the intellect and the will. Total absorption in God casts out distraction. Can we see that image again? We expend no effort at all. God does everything. This is an image of Teresa in the prayer of union, where she is simply in this ecstatic prayer and feeling one with the divine. What a fascinating, what a beautiful prayer journey. What powerful teaching. As these seven steps instruct, it isn't simply a life of prayer, but also a life of virtue or right action that helps us to attune more fully with the divine. Teresa taught that prayer transforms our hearts to be more loving and therefore more inspired to be good and do good in the world. In fact, we hear the echo of her words when we have communion and we become the body of Christ, or we say in a benediction, go and be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. She writes, Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks, compassion on the world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. As we walk through our own wilderness journey, perhaps we can draw upon the wisdom of this saint from so many years ago. Remember to pray. Remember that we are so incredibly loved by God, that God longs to simply spend time with us in prayer. We make time to spend with our children, our parents, our partners, our friends. Let's remember to spend some time with God. The close connection that we can establish through our prayer practices helps us to better know God and to know God's love for us which will help us resist the temptations that we so often 
find in our wilderness wanderings. Teresa of Avila stated, contemplative prayer is nothing else than a close sharing between friends. It means taking time frequently to be alone with him who we know loves us. The wilderness is inevitable. Death is inevitable. But God's love for us and God's willingness to be with us through these hard times is just as inevitable. Let's remember to tune in through prayer. Oh, beloved God, Mama God, Papa God, here we are. Hold us. We crave your love. We need your compassion and comfort. Life can be so hard. We have wept tears. Hold us as we cry. And thank you now and forever for loving us. Amen. And we'll continue our prayers this morning with the prayers that were brought forward I need to summarize this one. <laughs> um, we pray continued prayers for Reuben, who is continuing to recover from surgery. We thank God for the people who have been taking care of him and their patience in the times to come. And there is simply a lot of need, so if there is a lot of prayer, I'm not going to read all of this, but we lift it up in prayer as one prayed. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up a prayer for little Catherine, who celebrated her seventh birthday on Tuesday. Thank you, Lord, for Catherine, who teaches us so much. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up prayer for Linda's aunt, Laura's family. Laura's visitation and funeral services are this week. Lord, in your mercy. And we lift up prayers for Helen Sumney, who is receiving hospice care. Lord, in your mercy. And we lift up prayers again, as we mentioned early in our service, prayers for peace and safety for our Muslim neighbors, both close to home and around the world in the aftermath of the shootings in New Zealand. Beloved God, help us to love one another even better. Help us protect and care for the safety of our neighbors, no matter who they are. They are all your children. Lord, in your mercy. Beloved God, we lift up these prayers that have been prayed aloud. And we also lift up things that are in the quiet of our hearts. Prayers for young people, prayers for not so young people. Prayers for neighbors who live next door or neighbors who are on the other side of town. And we pray for this world. For all people. Lord, in your mercy. We pray these things using the words that Jesus taught us so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Let's grab my bulletin and see where we go next. Next thing is our offering. We're going to invite our ushers to come forward and take up our morning offering. This is a time for us to give back, to give out of the sense and space of love that we might be caring for all of God's children. 
The money that we give helps to feed the hungry and clothe the naked, welcome in the stranger, support those who are ill. Let us now bring our gifts to God. And as we do so, we will sing, Come and Fill Our Hearts. It's a Taze chant. It's very repetitive. Find yourself, if you can, easing in and centering ourselves through this prayer. Loving and gracious God, we pray that you would bless these gifts that we offer this day, that they might multiply like fish and loaves to feed the hungry in all the ways that people are hungry in this world. May we all be nourished. In your good name we pray. Amen. Just a few announcements today, but I'm going to ask a few people to come forward so that we're ready. I know that uh, Scott wanted to make a quick announcement. Adam and Steve, why don't you guys come on up so you're on deck. Um, I just have one announcement, which is that I think, I think we have a young adult brunch today, although I haven't seen, I don't know if the folks who are making it are downstairs. I haven't gone through to check. Have you seen them? All right. There'll be food downstairs. I haven't seen any young adults. So if you would like a nice brunch, and not all of you come, we, we won't have that many, but we have room for maybe, you know, five to ten. Come and join us for brunch after the service. Um, that's the only announcement that I have right now. Oh, uh, one other thing, you'll notice that there are some youth in the back. We spent the night last night with, uh, with a few young people here, Adam and Sarah and I, uh, sleeping in the Reed Booth room. So if, if we all look a little bedraggled, we had a wonderful time. It was great. We made a dinner uh, and brought it over to a new place last night. So it was a good... Good time for everybody. Lots of fun. Yeah, go ahead. Howard Center had their curling challenge last night. The other the other day uh, it went well. I was wondering if the church would like to get a team together for next year. Um, if you want to send a donation, send it to uh, Howard Center, 208 Flynn and care of Denise Vigno, Perfect. and that's in Burlington. Yeah, Scott was a volunteer for the Howard Center's curling uh, 
competition, which helps raise money for the Howard Center. Yeah. It's all about steps, S whether it be steps to recovery or whether it be the physical steps to our sanctuary or the physical steps to our fellowship hall or whether it be steps in any, um, well, anyway. <laughs> we are embarking on new territory, for me anyway, of participating in a fundraising campaign, and we're calling it It's About Steps. And there will be a link from our church website, umcburlington.com. That's a lot easier to remember, umcburlington.com, than the mile-long link <laughs> to this donation website as part of the Gannett Publications, USA Today is sponsoring a, a Community Thrives fundraising challenge. And they're challenging nonprofits throughout the country uh, to get involved with the community for raising funds for community events. And our community event is our steps our hosting 20 different 12-step groups here. Some, some of them even meet multiple times a week, as well as our need to fix our front steps and their steps to Fellowship Hall. So tomorrow you may get an email from the, from the church with a link to this. If you don't get that email, you can always go to the church website and take the link to this place. And hopefully this... You can't donate before noon tomorrow. Noon tomorrow is a four-week challenge from noon tomorrow until four weeks later. And there are, I think, some challenges every week for different bonuses if we make certain amounts. And you must, there are some rules. Uh, donations must be at least $10. They must be made by a credit card through this through this site in order to account towards the goal. But there's also a possibility of a grant that we've applied for, and that's why we're applying for it. Uh, gifts, each single gift cannot be more than $10,000, but you can make multiple $10,000 <laughs> gifts if you wish. I just want to announce, uh, hopefully you've seen this in the bulletin and, and the chimes, but the Hofstra University Chamber Choir will be here Thursday evening, 7 o'clock, for a free concert, and it's going to be fantastic. If you haven't seen some of these other uh, groups and, and singers and musicians we've had come through here, I know a lot of you haven't, because we never get a great turnout. I'd love to get a great turnout. Uh, this is a really fantastic group. It's free, and 7 o'clock Thursday Come, I know some of you got a dinner to go to at, at five o'clock. Uh, come after the dinner, seven o'clock, free concert. Also, there are a few people left that need to be hosted. Uh, we're not hosting them, but they've said, hey, any of your church people have a bed or two for a couple of these kids? If you feel like you might be able to host somebody overnight, um, you know, I think probably Thursday night into Friday, um, come talk to me afterwards. I'll be, I'll be around, and they just need a few extra beds for some of these students. Uh, but anyway, either way, I hope to see you on Thursday. Let us go now to our closing hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. It's in the red hymnal on page 377. Uh, the words are also going to be on the screen. Let us sing.
friends, I pray that each one of us would know the love of God, that love that comforts, that love that guides, and holds us so close in times of tragedy and struggle. May we know this love through the power of God, parent, friend, and holy guide. In God's name we pray. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us pass the peace of one another this day. Thank you.